Good evening. Welcome to One Step Beyond with me, Theo Chalmers. If you have any questions for our guest, text them to 86686 with the word beyond, a space, then your message, and we'll try to pick up on the good ones. They're all charged at standard rate. Tonight's show is a first for One Step Beyond. It's two hours long. My guest is author of the truly astonishing new book on 9-11, Where Did the Towers Go? Her websites are wheredidthetowersgo.com and drjudywood.com. There's a clue. She is the only person to ever file a legal challenge to the official version of 9-11, well, particularly with regard to the buildings, and where the judge asked her if she has a death wish. She is a former professor of mechanical engineering, and whatever, and whatever you think happened that day, she will challenge many beliefs. Taking one step beyond tonight is Dr. Judy Wood. Judy, welcome. Hello, thank you. You're very welcome. It's great to have you uh, live on the show, all the way from mm. South Carolina. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, yes. you're, you're, you're <laughs> Amazing, thanks. You're here in the studio. That's fantastic. Now, you, this, let me show the camera your book. This is, um, this is where, where Did the Tower Go? Um, it's an amazing book. I mean, it is so full of photographs and research and evidence. And it is literally breathtaking. I mean, it really is something special and obviously a labor of love. And I know you've worked on this for many years. Um, you also seem particularly well suited to have written this book because of your academic qualifications. Do you want to just give us a quick picture of those? Um, my bachelor's degree was in civil engineering, structural engineering specifically. Engineering mechanics was my master's degree, which is essentially applied physics. And my PhD is in materials engineering science, an interdisciplinary degree, bring in material properties as well as engineering mechanics. So basically, uh, you understand what should happen to that building, or those two buildings, in particular, and Building 7, but what should have happened if they were hit by planes? Or collapse due to fires or whatnot. But in addition to that, my area of expertise is in image analysis and optical methods. So you, you've got the whole spectrum, haven't you? If, if they were going to find somebody to do this job, to write yes. this book, it would be you. I suppose so. It's a very unique combination of things. And you've kind of taken this upon yourself, haven't you? I mean, at the risk of your career and many other things. Because what happened that day was so unbelievable to the average person. I could see it clearly. Not necessarily every detail on day one, but that something extraordinary happened that needed to be studied. You, and, and I mean, one of your main sort of theses, if you like, is is the title of your book, Where Did the Towers Go? Because you say that... They, they went just, away. They just kind of, they blew away, didn't they? they? Gone with the wind. They disappeared. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're gonna, I think the first thing we should look at is one of the films from the day. If we can have that first film, please. This is, this is a slow-mo film of the North Tower. So can you describe what's happening here? This is slow motion of the building coming apart. I do not say collapse because it surely isn't collapsing. If you'll notice, as the building comes apart, you'll see pieces of steel and building parts falling down. But as they fall down, they're trailing dust. And they sort of, they seem to disappear. I noticed, well, I've seen this film a few times preparing for this show. And there's a, a section in the middle, right in the middle of the screen, where there's a white line going up. Falling onto that now is a piece, right. which then seems to disappear. It's a long-shaped uh, piece of material, and it falls down straight in front of that corner of the building. And as it does, it just it, it disappears. It dissolves into dust. Uh, which is quite extraordinary. And it, it looks like as much stuff is going up as is going down. Or even sort of squirts up and arcs over before it comes down. But if you go to that intersection right below that, after the building goes away, there's some people that come out of their hiding places, and they're, they're stopped. You, they look like they'd have their jaw hanging open. Just unbelievable. There's no you know, steel on the ground in front of them. There's just dust and paper. And that's one of the, the, the sort of things of the day, isn't it, is the huge amount of paper 
and powdered concrete or powdered whatever it was. Powdered building. Powdered building. And everything in it. That was covering Manhattan. Right. So, so okay, I, I think we should, we should look at, we're going to hit the ground running, I think, today, because we, we, although we've got two hours, we've got a lot of stuff to cover, haven't we? So I think we need to go to um, picture uh, 1106, if we can see that one. Right, this is, this is the arcade underneath. Will you tell us what that is? This is actually the uh, loading zone where they made the deliveries, the ramp, under buildings four and five. And the foreground is purple. That means it's under building four, five. And the green part is under building four. And if you look down at the end of that hallway, you see a green wall where you have to make a right turn to pull out of the, the parking garage. This picture was taken after 9-11. You might, might, maybe it's a little bit more dusty on the ground, but it's still intact. The lights are still on. And the interesting part of the end of that hall is that it's underneath where Building 4 used to be, but there's no building there there's above no, it. There's no building. Well, let's look at, let's look at a 102. This is, this is the site of uh, World Trade Center 1 north and south walls. So this is after a 110-story building. Went has, away. Okay, I know you, you don't like to say collapse. Went away. You were, went away, okay. And... You know, I've read some statistics that there should be, you know, if you, if you collapse a building, there should be at least 12% of the original height on the ground, and 110 stories would make, what, 15 stories of rubble. It doesn't look to me like there's 15 stories of rubble there. Uh, you see an ambulance parked there at ground level, so you know where ground level is. Yeah, there's, there's the ambulance, right, absolutely. So... Also, this was a steel frame structure. And in the foreground of this picture, do you see any steel? No, you don't. You, don't. you see a few <laughs> yeah, pieces of aluminum again. cladding. <laughs> it is quite extraordinary, isn't it? Okay, let's go to 103. This is, uh, 103 is a map. It's a satellite image. Satellite image. This is after 9-11, on the, very shortly after 9-11. Do you know how long? I think it was the, either the 23rd or the 27th. Okay of September 2001. Okay, so no chance really to have cleared it all up. No. So, uh, and, and, what, and what you can see there is, um, well, the towers are completely gone. Uh, WTC6 on the top right hand corner. Has that big void in it where about 50% of the building's mass is just gone. But the rest of it is still there. And, and some of the other buildings are gone, of course, WTC7 uh, has gone as well. And the bottom left-hand corner, that building was building four, and just the north wing, which north is to the right, just the north wing remains, and the rest was gone, basically down to ground level. Gone, you just sweep it up. So how can <laughs> half a building disappear and the other half still be standing? It looked like it was sliced off with an X-Acto knife. We don't know what exacto knives are ah. in the UK, I'm afraid, Judy. <laughs> razor blade, razor blade. A razor blade, okay. And, and of course, with this hole in, in the World Trade Center 6, it's a kind of similar thing, isn't it? It's, it's been sort of gouged out with something. Or it's, so. it's a void, empty. You, you know, some people say, well, stuff must have fallen in it. Well, if debris fell in it and collapsed it down, you look in the bottom of the hole, you should see something. Okay, let's, we're, we're going to whiz through some more pictures, I think. Let's look at number 104, 104. Right, this is... Um, it's an elevation map of what was left. And I've drawn in a, sort of a ghost outline of what should have been there, what had been there, to build, two tall buildings, a 22-story building, and the other buildings, which are eight and nine stories tall. I don't see, w, I don't see World Trade Center 7 on this. It's, it's off to the right. So it's just out of frame. Yes. That was a 47-story building, wasn't right, it? Right, right. Which in most U.S. states would have been the tallest building. Or most cities, and as well as the 22-story building 3. Yeah. That one went away, and very few people talk about that. 22 stories, yeah, that's significant. I mean, if that yeah. was in London, for instance, that would be perhaps our third or fourth tallest building. But it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. And there's a quote there, isn't there, from uh, a firefighter. I'll, I'll, I'll read this out. I looked and said, guys, there used to be 106 floors above us, and now I'm seeing sunshine. There's nothing above us. That big building doesn't exist. 
These are the biggest office buildings in the world, and I didn't see one desk or one chair or one phone, nothing. They're in the bottom of Tower One. They were in Tower One. They were in got... Tower One, between the third and fourth floor and stairwell B. Yeah. And they assumed when the building, they thought, collapsed, they assumed they were buried under such debris that they'd be dead by the time anyone found them. Well, I mean, just look at the uh, earthquake that's happened in Turkey uh, yesterday and today that they're talking about today. And, and there are piles of rubble where the buildings have collapsed. I mean, layer upon layer, floor layer upon floor layer of rubble, which they're struggling to get people out of. They, they haven't disappeared, have they, those buildings? In, in my book, I put uh, a picture of a, a pancaked building from an earthquake in Pakistan. And there, right after it happened, another striking difference is the clear air, not filled with dust. Oh, and the, yeah, it was very dusty, wasn't it? Okay, let's let's have a look at number 105, please. Right now, where is this? That's under the first layer, right underneath Building Four. This is under Building Four again. And you can look and see what stores. This is the mall. You can see it was Innovation Luggage is on the left. The next one down is Hallmark Cards. At the end, it's a little bit punched in. And that's the missing part of Building 4. They're right under Building 4. Oh, where it was sliced in half. Exactly. They're right above that parking garage. So this was a little bit damaged at the end. They're still walking upright. Yeah. But uh, the parking garage was below them, and it didn't go that, that far down. That, that is extraordinary. Okay, let's go to 106. The parking garage. That's the, the loading docks right below where the mall was. That's so when they unload the, the goods, they know where they are. And this is under which building? Uh, buildings 5 and 4. 5 and 4. The purple is under 5 and the green is under 4. And the green at the end of the hall is under the, about the middle of, um, underneath the missing part of building 4, okay. that main body. Okay, let's go above ground now and go to uh, 107. We're looking west through the complex, and there's stairwell B, that little stub left. You can see right, a little bit to the right of the center of the picture. Is this where that Jay Jonas was? Yes. He, he was in that stairwell. There's 14 of them that survived there. And there was a 110-story building, the, the, at least 106 floors of which were above their head. Yes. And they were calling out on their handy talkies to their buddies, you know, to come rescue them. And we're in stairwell B. Tower one, where are you? Tower one, stairwell B, where are you? Stairwell B, tower one. They say, where's tower one? <laughs> yeah. If you looked at that, would you see a building? Can we see that again? Can we just pop back to that 107 again, please? I mean, that just is, well, it's disappeared, hasn't it? Yeah, Apart from stairwell B, something, you know, survived, but. You see the north wall, the north uh, corner facade, and there's only about eight stories of corner facade that were there. Everything else? Gone. Down to ground level. Okay, we're going we're gonna to run, we're going to have the last, the last picture, and then we're going to talk some more about this. This is 108. Um, this is another view of Building 6, isn't it, with the hole in it? Yes, a closer view. And in the foreground, you see that dome from the World Financial Center, Building 2. This is not the World Trade Center, this is the World, World Financial, Financial Center. Center. It's right across the street. Yeah. Do you notice uh, how clean that top is? No damage? It's right across the street? It hasn't been hit by anything, has it? No. And th what's that void across the street from it, uh, where Tower 1 was, you can see the north uh, wall is about eight stories left because Building 6 was eight stories. Where are the other 102 stories? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. So, well, Judy, you've looked at the evidence for how many years have you been doing this? So nearly ten. ten years? Ten years you've been looking at this evidence and you've, you've pinned it down and you've pinned it down and... Where'd it go? Dust. Gone with the wind. So, Blown away, most of it. So, but this isn't Kansas, Tonto, is it? <laughs> no, it's... Uh, Actually, that was the wrong to, film, wasn't it? I do right. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I've just looked at the evidence. I believe in looking at the evidence because the evidence will, will tell you what happened, exactly what happened. Just looking at the evidence. Just looking at not the evidence. Not making any assumptions, not saying it was this, it right. was that. And as soon as you start making assumptions, you're fixing to mess up. 
Well, it does, it does seem to me, and I've studied this myself as, you know, from the outside, if you like, for very many years, and there are a lot of people out there who've made, uh, well, they have an opinion about what happened on that day, uh, and they say that the buildings were not destroyed in the way, according to the official report, the 9-11 Commission report, uh, but they were destroyed by other methods like thermite or thermate or nanothermite or superthermite or um, mini nuclear weapons or other methods. Do you reject all of those? I begin by looking at the evidence and you rule out the impossible and what remains has got to be among what is possible. And one of the things, uh, the biggest things I discovered in looking at this evidence, the three main things, the buildings didn't burn up or slam to the ground, but turned into dust in midair. And I know that because if they slammed to the ground, you'd see a pile of debris there. Didn't happen. There was a lot of debris all over Manhattan, though, wasn't there? But not that, not uh, two buildings worth of each 500,000 tons plus a 230,000 ton building across the street. Building 7. Right. A lot of mass is missing. Uh, the, yeah, the weird thing, because those two towers were built, if I can sort of pricey the way that they were built, because I have looked at this, and they had something like 47 columns in the middle mm -hmm. of each tower, sort of slightly offset, but more or less in the center mm -hmm. of each tower. And then they had uh, steel beams connecting to um, what, were, what you call wheat checks on the outside, but we would call like shreddies because wheat checks is a breakfast <laughs> yeah. cereal, right? And uh, so like a kind of uh, cross-section of steel clad with aluminium with the windows set in, and that actually had a structural purpose as well. Oh, very much. They, they were a tube within a tube type design. There was an outer structure. So the outer structure was a tube. Well, no, well, yeah, around the whole building, kind around of like a building. tube. And then the inner columns were like another And they were much tube. more solid, weren't they? The inner columns were massively thick steel. I've looked at uh, biomimicry, you know, mimicking nature. Well, like a with, tree or something. Right, with engineering designs for, for strength, mm -hmm. because trees are very strong. Mm -hmm. And that is biologically inspired. The design is like a tree. A tree can bend a lot, and it has this tube within a tube structure. Mm -hmm. Just one, not just one tube, but the tube within a tube. So the building was built with the outer columns, uh, I think it was 59 on each side of mm -hmm. the four, and then with these 47 inner columns, and the floors were connected between the inner and outer columns. And they were meant to move with the breeze. Yeah, and they did, didn't they? Yeah. they, they were, it was known that they did in a strong mm -hmm. wind. Yeah. I was actually in New York in 1985 in a hurricane. Hur Hurricane Gloria. Wow. And they closed downtown, and uh, the World Trade Center area was closed, the Wall Street area was closed, and it was really scary. Bits were falling off buildings in Times I was in Times Square, and it was quite a scary experience, actually. <laughs> but look it up, it's online. Hurricane Gloria, 1985, 24 years ago. So, uh, yeah, but. Um, they made a big deal of it. We'll get to that later, because there was a hurricane, wasn't there, on that day, and they didn't make a big deal of it, which is very interesting. So, the buildings disappeared. Um, also, if they'd slammed to the ground, they would have destroyed the bathtub. Yes. The bathtub is sort of like a dike built around the base of them, because the towers are built on bedrock 70 feet below the water table. Yeah. They're built in the Hudson River with this dike around them. And there are subways that came from New Jersey under the river that connected there, as well as connecting This is with, the Underground Railway. Yes, the PATH trains. Yeah. And there were subways all around Manhattan that intersected there. Again, this is railways. Subways is railways yep. in New York. Oh, okay. I didn't realize you didn't have the same terms. And if two 500,000-ton buildings had crashed down on that bathtub, it certainly would have ruptured the bathtub would have flooded the bathtub, flooded lower Manhattan. And flooded the railway lines. Yes, that didn't happen. Okay, and that didn't happen either. So, and also there's seismic evidence as well, isn't it, that there was no big right. thud. If they crashed to the ground, the seismic signal would have reflected that, and it didn't. Matter of fact, the ground only shook for eight seconds when the North Tower went away. It takes nine and a half seconds to throw a bowling ball off the roof and have it hit the pavement. So there was eight seconds of vibration. Yes. 
but even then it wasn't sufficient to have caused any damage to the structure. And you can see in those other images we showed of those underground parking and all, they were just in the mall. Below the ground seemed to, for the most part, uh, remain undamaged. It's, you know, small amounts of damage here and there, but not, nothing like what you would get if you dropped a million tons of building crashing down so on it. So collectively, yeah. it, it was a million tons, was it? Uh, for the two buildings. The two towers? Yeah. What, well, leaving out buildings? Right, building, th building three and four and six and, and seven. seven. So just the two towers, the 110 story towers. About 500,000 tons each. I mean, that is a huge, and of course they fell at not quite free fall speeds, didn't they? Uh, they didn't fall. No. <laughs> so okay. I'll, I'll keep, keep that, with you I on know that. You keep picking me up on this, okay. But uh, the ground only shook for eight seconds. That's uh, getting rid of the building faster than it would free fall. There was some falling though, wasn't there? In, the, in that, where the section of the, of the first tower that fell tips. But then it turned to dust. It didn't fall to the ground. <laughs> but okay, but what I'm saying is, from the first moment of movement of each building, before it disappeared, was almost, but not quite, the time it would have taken if, it, if everything that supported it was removed at the same time and it simply fell. Uh, if it had fallen, it would have taken longer. That's clear. If any, if, if it even is possible, if the roof... it, it is theoretically possible that the Twin Towers could have fallen if every structural supporting mechanism had been removed as it fell by some process. Like, for instance, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, Judy. If you um, removed all of the, the supports... If somebody put some nanothermite on it, you know, and that all went off, because that is what people are saying, isn't it? People well, dispute okay. your version of events. If people uh, used nanothermite or whatever they used to cut the columns, you still have 500,000 tons of debris that would slam to the ground. All you're doing is cutting it down, and it would slam to the ground. So you, uh, you don't think that's... Uh... And it can't cut it like that. It takes a, it, thermite works through heat transfer, and it takes a certain amount of time for heat to transfer through large, thick pieces of steel. It doesn't happen instantly. We're, we are all familiar with thermite, actually, because sparklers that we use yes. uh, on Guy Fawkes night are effectively thermite, Yes, aren't they? When you light a sparkler, which is you're lighting metal, aren't you, which is quite hard to light. Once you light, they're very hot and they're very intense. That's so, another thing. There wasn't hot, hot heat. Uh, well, some say that there was. There were, there were, you know, molten iron in the ground for days, and some say there I, wasn't. I've not seen any evidence of it. Well, <laughs> this, is a, this is a contentious point. Okay, look, we, we are going to go for a break now. Uh, so, uh, if you'd like to text in your questions or comments for Dr. Judy Wood, please do so now to 86686 with the word BEYOND. See you back here soon. Welcome back to our One Step Beyond with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, Dr. Judy Wood. I'm going to read out a couple of texts now. Um, Linda says, are any other scientists looking at this theory and how has it been received? You have obviously worked hard on this. Any other scientists yes. supporting you in this? Yes, there are uh, quite a few scientists who are quietly supporting me. They're uh, sitting quietly wondering when they want to stick their neck out because look what's happened to me. Well, you have been attacked, haven't you? You've, you've been, you've been uh, vilified and so on uh, by quite a few people and you've taken a, a risk. Uh, I'm trying to find another text here, but I'm having a bit of trouble scrolling up the screen. Uh, but there's so much, isn't oh, it interesting how much energy is spent in the vilification? Yeah, well, a lot of energy is. Uh, somebody here, this is Jan, who says, I think Judy's version of what happened to the towers is the most realistic yet. It is terrifying what is going on. Judy is so brave, admire her so much. So there is support out there. Uh, let me just scroll down the bottom again. See what, because uh, they're coming in thick and fast now. 86686, the word beyond. And uh, don't forget to put that word in or we won't get them. Um, yeah, this is interesting because we were talking about whether it was hot or not before the break.
Charlie Worrell says, firefighters interviewed said it was like a foundry with molten rivers of metal. And I've seen those films, and I'm sure you have, where they say that. So how do you, um, how do you match that up with it being not hot? How, how can they think that there were molten rivers of steel? Because people often see things that are glowing and assume it's hot. Hot things do glow, but not everything that glows is hot. So you're kind of making special pleading here, aren't you? You're saying no, that... No, it's not a special pleading. I'm looking at evidence. And if you see something that's glowing, that's sitting on a piece of paper, and the paper's not burning, can that be glowing because it's hot? If it's going to glow because it's hot, it has to be at least 1,100 degrees centigrade to be this like white hot glow and if it's sitting on a piece of paper how can you have something 1100 degrees centigrade sitting on a piece of paper without the paper burning okay well that's interesting okay well i'm going to read one more uh well, then we're going to go back with some some more images and so on this is uh, a chap in tyneside who says i'm a radio ham in tyneside he gives out his call sign but i won't read it out uh, were there any major comms disruption? Was there any major comms disruption on 9-11 that could be caused by a huge energy EMP? What is that? Electromechanical? Uh, ele electromagnetic uh, pulse. pulse. Was it? Uh, not that I know of directly, and there is, I've seen no evidence of it. I've looked at physical evidence. I've tried to stay away from the um, hearsay type evidence because Let's face it, 9-11 was a psychological operation. And in a psychological operation, no matter how honest people are, they have been led to conclude different things than what happened. But if you physically look at things with logic and with what you know and figure out what you, you know that you know and separate that from what you know that you don't know and try not to confuse the two because you tend to bias your observations that way. Okay. All right. I think we need to go to another film. Uh, we've got one called Dustification, so if we, can, if we can run that second film, please. Or Dustified. Here we go. This is several clips of the... Of, well, <laughs> as I like to say, the collapses. I repeat. You can see that piece falling in front of that corner that dissolves. Okay. It is an extraordinary film. And this is a spike here that just disappears in the middle here. There's a spike of the central column. That may indeed be right above stairwell B. And that just seems to, there it goes, it just seems to Faint. turn into... Faint. Faint, into dust. dust. And here's, here's more images. I mean, the speed is unbelievable, isn't it? The speed of this activity, whatever it is. Dustification. This <laughs> dustification. A new phenomenon needs a new word to describe it. And I don't think we've ever seen a building do this before. Well, no steel frame buildings, apart from those three on 9-11, have ever... Three? I think there were seven. <laughs> seven oh, okay, seven well, were destroyed that day. Of course, that's true. Well, we normally talk about the Twin Towers and Building 7, right. the tallest ones. But as you say, there were, there were several others. And, and that then, enormous and dust like cloud. A, there's a sort of pyroclastic flow, isn't there? They're like a But it a wasn't volcano. hot. It wasn't hot. It wasn't hot, was it? Or, you know, or was it? I mean... We can look at the evidence. We can look at the evidence. We've got some more photographs. Here's, here's, I think this is but honestly, final. ask yourself, when you look at that, does that look like a collapse? And what's trailing behind those pieces of steel? You see how that well, peels like a banana? Again. Let's look, look at that but spire. did you see how it peels like a banana around it? Uh, yeah, that's true. But look at, look at the spire. This is fascinating, this spire in the middle here, as it just seems to turn into dust. Uh, it's taking its time. It's yeah, it drops down a little bit and kind of just faints. And oh, that's it. It's Poof. gone. That, that is... That's one of the most compelling things that I've seen, actually. Uh, I think we need to look at some photographs of... Let's, let's look at image 113, if we can, please. Okay, this is 113. What is this telling us? This is a still image where you see these wheat checks, the prefab outer units. Uh -huh. uh, they're three stories wide, three... Um, I mean, three stories tall, three columns wide, prefab units that the buildings are built out of, mm -hmm. the outer columns. And you see 
There's groups one of those on the left, isn't there? The extreme left there. There's one of those. These right. are the outer steel Columns. sections that are yeah. performing a structural function. Right. Which is one of the reasons the windows were so small in the World Trade Center. There, so, there the distance between those columns. Yeah. The windows. Because that was one of the reasons it was hard to let because the windows were so small and people felt a bit constricted, apparently. But, but these, this is steel falling. There, you can see some aluminum cladding which coated the steels or covered the steels floating around. But the, the basic thing you see falling is uh, the steel. But what's trailing behind it? Is that from a dirty windowsill, all that dust? Yeah, where does it come from? It look, the steel dissolving into dust. Yeah. Okay, let's look at 115 now, please. This is lots of different images of the same event. Of those that spire is referred to. Yeah. And you can see how the tower peels away, kind of like a banana peeling away from that, those uh, small group of columns that's referred to as the spire. Notice the spire extends above Building 7. Yeah. Building 7 is about, you know, 650 feet tall, I think. But this, the spire is about 700 feet tall. This is, this is this massively solid 47 central right. steel columns. But just a group of them that just stay freestanding for a bit there. Well, they, they would, wouldn't they? I mean, they, they don't would. have anything loading on them. Even if the official version, the pancaking, were to happen, it wouldn't you, take down the central columns. Right. They would still be standing there, surely. I mean, you're, you know, you're a, a structural engineer. You would be able to tell it, me that. You're, you're taking the load off of them, so they now have no reason to come down. Yeah, and they're they not going to blow down, are they? They're not going to. Well, if they blew down, they'd take out several blocks worth of buildings because they... Hundreds of thousands of tons, tens of tons. Well, tons. you have uh, 700 feet of this beating pole going down. It's going to do some damage to the adjacent buildings. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at 116 then. This is another image of this spire. Um, and the sequence at the bottom, this is... To what you need to pay attention to very, very carefully. That first image, notice how there's blue sky in the background, there's crisp edges of, the, of those columns. Yeah. The tower had just peeled away from it and exposed these columns. And then pretty soon you notice, like in the middle picture, it's no longer a crisp edge. And then it turns to dust. Now some folks say that that's dust that settled on it. And it's just blowing off. And, right, and it's so fine it hangs in the air. If it's that fine and hangs in the air, how come you didn't see it hanging in the air in that first image? When it was sharp, you mean? Right, when the, the building peeled away from so the left So this is exposed. your scientific analysis. If it was fine dust hanging in the air, first of all, how's it going to settle on a vertical column? Okay, all right, yeah. let's, let's talk about this dust, whether it was hot then. And, and before we do, let's look at this picture. 117, if you can. Right, this is, these are the people covered in this dust. The dust cloud rolled out, rolled over people, didn't burn them, just left them covered with dust. Okay, somebody here has asked, um, I haven't got a name here, what happened to the huge antenna on top of the North Tower? I believe it, for the most part, landed on the ground, surprisingly. So the antenna? The parts of the antenna. Survived. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? So things that were thrown out a long way seem to survive. Things that were kind of outside of the structure of the main building, like the antenna on the roof of the North Tower, seem to survive. And things that were outside the structure of the main building under the ground generally seem to survive. So yeah. it was kind of pretty much confined to the two twin towers themselves and the other buildings to some extent? Uh, not necessarily. There's some no. other patterns that emerge from this. Uh, up to half a mile away, there were toasted cars. I refer to them as toasted cars, as in they're toast. They're we're going to get to the cars. We're going we're to get to the cars. We're so that, was, that wasn't confined to just that area. It was... Uh, Okay, let's, 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 look at the, let's look at the bathtub then, because underneath, as we described in the first part, the bathtub is underneath the buildings, um, and this protects that site from the Hudson River. Right, because the towers are built... on the west of Manhattan. Yeah, the towers are built in the Hudson River, and this was a, sort of a dike. So if we can look at 113, here we go, this is 113. And this is after uh, the, um, the cleanup. 
I don't mean 1132, I mean... Uh, 109. 109, I beg your pardon, 109. Um, and this, this shows the bathtub, which is pretty much perfect. Right. There was some damage to it here and there from the earth movement equipment that was cleaned up, but it was not a catastrophic uh, failure. Okay. So that, that, that kind of shows what was there after the towers were cleaned away, what was left of the towers. And uh, let's look at 110, can we? This is a photograph from inside the, the bathtub. Um, again, showing it to be pretty much perfect. And they're, yeah. they're rebuilding on that side, aren't they? They have already yeah. rebuilt Building 7. Oh, Building 7 was just outside. So you're right, it was across the street. But this is uh, where the footprint of Tower 1 was. You can sort of see the shiny um, ground in the foreground. That's the bedrock okay. of Tower 1. Okay, let's look, let's look at one more image then of the... Um, of the dust and so on, and the, and the uh, let's look at number 111. Why wasn't there a large seismic impact? Because it's all over the street. <laughs> as, I guess as powder and lots and lots of paper again. Okay, so um, it, it, the evidence does seem to be mounting that those buildings did just turn to dust and effectively blow away. What about evidence of them taking the steel to China? And you saw the ground within a day or so of 9-11. Of so there what, were what pieces steel? of steel. There were, I know there are pieces of steel. But, but uh, two 500,000 ton buildings worth? There was 100,000 tons of steel in each of the towers. You didn't see that on the ground. Did they take it away before noon on 9-11? Hmm. It was gone pretty quickly. Okay, it well, was gone by the time the dust cloud cleared, enough so you could see the ground. And I've not seen any receipts of uh, steel going to China. It's just well, a story. They might, not, they might decide not to show you. I mean, you, know, you know. But how do you know they went to China? Well, that, that's, that's <laughs> the story we've been told. Isn't right, it? right. So, okay, so you, you believe that... Um, the whole build, all the buildings turned to dust, something was Not used. all of them turned to dust, but a well, significant portion of them turned to dust. The vast majority of them yes, turned yeah. to dust. Well, okay, so if it wasn't thermite, thermate, nanothermite, superthermate, small nuclear weapons, um, I don't know, lots of gnomes with pickaxes, <laughs> <laughs> what was it, Judy? It's something that can turn uh, material to dust. There's a whole lot of different aspects of this, and I, I don't know exactly what they use, but I, can, I know somebody who can replicate all of the effects of that. Mm -hmm. Several people actually can replicate all the, those effects. And actually, there was a patent on this technology 100 years ago yesterday. Yeah, you showed me the picture in your book, and you, you were speaking publicly, weren't you, yesterday? Yes. And you yes. showed the picture, and you said this was exactly 100, and this is a patent on a device that could levitate steel and... Radiant energy. <clears throat> Radiant energy. The question that I must ask is, if there is such a device that can disintegrate buildings, and it was in use on 9-11, 10 years ago, why isn't it being used today in, say, Libya, or in Iran, or in Afghanistan, or in other, you know, Yemen, countries like that, if the powers that be have that weapon, well, why don't we see it being used all the time? What, and then we could go, ah, look, there it is. What's the objective? Yeah. You, you first need to figure out what the objective is before you know why it would or wouldn't be used. You, you're assuming an objective. Well, it, it, it seems to me that it's something that's been weaponized. Right. And, that, you know, the, the, the mind of man is such that you give him a... A, a, an apple, and he'll probably wonder how hard he can throw it at somebody. <laughs> you know, and so if, if you couldn't, you couldn't uh, get, get it out of the hands of the military if you had right. if you had a toy like this. But like, see, it tends, depends on what your objective is. If your objective is to wreak havoc, uh, you know, this is too clean. You might, you know, might not want to use it if you want. To, if that is what your objective is, it depends on the objective. Well, it kills people as well, obviously, because. The right. people who were in those towers disintegrated also, didn't they? The, par the parts that they found of them 
I've seen one image of one of the biggest parts they found, which isn't very nice. It was just a hand, and that was about it. There wasn't much to be found. So, you know, if it was, if it is a weapon, it can be used for. Okay, you're you're you know. asking for a lot of speculation. Yeah, but if you I want, to, you like to stick to the, fact, the facts. But sure. but if you want to speculate, and if you wanted to destroy Manhattan, yeah. I don't think you would use this, would you? you? You could just, if you tipped over the building, you'd take out all of Manhattan. Those big, were big buildings. This was a very careful removal of the buildings. No, I, Minimum I, I destruction. Appreciate, I appreciate there are lots of advantages to making right. them disappear rather than knocking them over right. or even having them collapse into the bathtub and fracture and let the Hudson right. River in. I appreciate that. What I'm saying to you is, if if this device, whatever it is, and I know you have a name for it, directed energy weapon. Mm, it's under a general category. It's energy that's directed and used as a weapon. Okay. So if some military somewhere had to develop and had access to weapon, a weapon that could do what you claim was done on 9-11, why haven't we seen it in use elsewhere? You'll have to ask them, but perhaps they, it's a different objective they have. Do they, if, are there buildings they want to dustify? Well, you know, have, we, is, have we seen anything <laughs> like it anywhere? Is there, per, per, are there hints of things? Perhaps, perhaps, but it, it helps to really study the evidence first to be able to identify it. I know what the process is, so I have a, a name for the process. It's, you know, the general category is energy that's directed and used as a weapon. Now Tesla had this in America worked for Edison, didn't he? Thomas Edison. Right, he he immigrated to here and but he's to there. <laughs> oh, oh right, right. I I've forgotten here. I forgot about that. But uh, he's responsible for having um, outlets we can plug things into. Yeah. yeah. Alternating, well, alternating current? Alternating current is his, that's right. And a whole lot of things. He's pretty much responsible for modern life style. And uh, a lot of his patents are, uh, are under lock and key for national security reasons. Uh -huh. He wanted to give free energy to the world, but was afraid it would be used for evil purposes. It was around 100 years ago. Yeah. So, okay, so... You're not only claiming then that these directed energy weapons were developed by whoever, we don't know, and used by whoever, we don't know, for whatever purpose. And lots of people have asked the question, Ki bono, you know, who benefited from the falling of the towers? You first have to establish what happened. Okay, well, let's, I understand that. But, you're, but what you're suggesting now is not only were these weapons developed and used, but that they use free energy? Am I correct in that? They, this is uh, evidence of free energy technology. And what I mean by free energy is non-conventional. Energy that is not metered, has not been metered. So, okay, but just because it's not metered, you, can, you know, you can cheat the, the, the socket. Well, it's, house, not, it's, not, not, it's not, it's not conventional it. either. It's not conventional. It's what is zero point energy or I don't give it that name. motion energy or... Actually, if I were to give it a name, I, my, the name I would give it is Magnetic Electrogravitic Nuclear Reactions. Which kind of covers everything, doesn't it? <laughs> what, what doesn't it cover? Yeah, Electrogravitic Nuclear Reactions uh, describes low-energy uh, low nuclear reactions, which the slang term for it is called fusion. Oh, this is, this is the, the ponds and fish, Flushman, right, isn't it? Right. The, the cold fusion thing that was discredited. In fact, discredited, I think, partly by one of the main proponents of the nanothermite. Mm-hmm. You can see a trend here? <laughs> and you know who coined the term cold fusion to discredit it? Stephen Jones? Yes. Oh, well. Okay, so um, you're saying that... Uh, not only are you saying that these, these weapons exist, they've been developed, they're using zero-point energy or some kind of free energy source, uh, but you're also saying now, if I'm correct, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to 
work through this logically that um, but if, if you have many, trouble... Hold on, let me get to the point. Okay. Many, many proponents of, if you like, the truth movement are dissembling deliberately to avoid revealing this big mm. set of secrets. It doesn't take uh, many people. Uh, folks within an organization tend to follow the leader of the organization. And there's undoubtedly a lot of well-meaning people following that. I, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure, you know, a lot of people in the truth movement who, who accept the theories of nanothermite, mm -hmm. if you like, are well-meaning, good people who look at the obvious fallacies in the official version of events. If you think about it, the official story was a psychological operation. Um, and it was very well planned. Do you think they just forgot to plan a cover-up? So th this is their limited hangout, is it? The, the, the limited hangout is, OK, it wasn't the planes. The planes didn't do it, and uh, nothing hit Building 7. There are going to be people who come along who realize that. So you need someplace else for them to go. So, so, the, the, so the limited hangout is, um, is that it, um, is that, you know, okay, if you don't accept version one, we'll give you version two. Yeah. Because we want to protect. If you don't like version two, we'll give you version one. If you have a false choice. Is there a version three? Is there a, is there a limited hangout? Well, there's a, there seems to be some backups for that. But if you, instead of following some sort of, of um, scenario that someone else is giving you, what I prefer to do and what the aim of my book has been is to empower the reader to understand for themselves instead of having to follow anybody. This is just evidence. Mm. If you look at the evidence, the evidence will tell you exactly what happened. The buildings turned to dust. So, that, it, it, I mean, that's the safest place to be, isn't it? Just looking at the evidence. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, you've made some certain conclusions, and I know, and that's kind of, it puts you in a vulnerable position. It means you can easily be attacked by those who have a mind to do that. But they, no one has refuted what is in my book. And it's a massive, massive, massive book of... And none of it has been refuted. Not a single thing. Not, not one, a single no thing. No one said, ah, oh, but this is wrong. Correct. You haven't had to make any revision or say, no, nah, I was a little bit no. wrong there. Because I've only talked about what is there, what is actually there, the evidence. People have... Well, we've got to go for another break now. All right. Uh, yeah, come back after the break or text your answers to, your questions to 86686 with the word beyond, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back to One Step Beyond with me, Theo Chalmers, and my special guest, Dr. Judy Wood. Judy, I've got to read out this text here. Um, this is from Mike in Manchester. He says, uh, Theo, I think your guest is as daft as a box of frogs. Excellent example. Excellent <laughs> example. No, no, they did not refute my book. And no, so they, it's just an ad hominem attack. Right. They don't address the evidence. They don't address what I present. Okay. Um, are you saying that then the concrete doesn't turn to dust when it falls upon each floor when collapsing? That's Phil. That the steel beams going down with dust trailing behind it, that's not falling onto another floor. And we're just seeing that earthquake, you know, great right. amounts of concrete have no fallen. No dust in the air. Well, very little dust in the well, air. And also the, they're still there, the concrete blocks, aren't they? They're still concrete. They're stacked up, you get the pancakes. <laughs> yeah. The um, pancakes. Because they're set, it's setting in so many texts, it's quite, they keep moving, it's really hard to read them. Um, this is Carl in the Wirral says, uh, have you had any comments from the people who compiled the NIST report? Have they responded in any way? They're not likely well, to, I suppose. Well, I did or... submit a request for correction to NIST in 2007. Let's call, talk about your key TAM. Qu yeah. Key TAM is Q-U-I-T-A-M. Is yes. this your legal action? Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a call for correction, isn't it? Uh, two separate things. I submitted a request for correction to NIST saying that... This is the National Institute of Standards and Technology? Yes, and they were... Uh, mandated by Congress with our taxpayer money to determine why and how the towers collapsed. Collapsed. Yeah, that's, and that was the name of the report. Yet NIST admitted to me they did not analyze the collapse. 
They admitted that in writing. In writing to me. Yes. So they're admitting their report was fraudulent. The contractors for the NIST report... Well, you they're not admitting that their report is fraudulent. They're admitting that they didn't do the job they were paid to do. That's, That's slightly, right. slightly different, isn't and it? And accepting payment for that is fraud. Okay. Yeah, you and got them there. <laughs> now, we can't sue the government, a government agency, but we can sue the contractors who committed science fraud. But NIST is a government agency, isn't right, it? Right, but the contractors they hired to help them with the report. Yes. Interestingly enough, they hired folks who are uh, experts in developing energy weapons. Okay. So they knew not what, to, what not to say, perhaps. Right, and to look over it. Oh, just for clerical uh, use, right, just to sharpen our pencils. No, they, uh, they knew what they were looking at. Okay, so um, is this, this action you took then was against the contractors, or was it right. wasn't it a it demand was, for correction? Wasn't this well, key first, time? Was that a separate thing? The, this was the beauty of what my lawyer had figured out, that in order to file a key time case, it's a whistleblower case. You need to do an act of whistleblowing. My request for correction to NIST was my act of whistleblowing. I was notifying a government agency that their contractors had committed science fraud, and I listed the things that they had done fraudulently. This is the one where the judge said to you, have, a, have you a death wish? That, that was, um, I used to talk so much about that, but people in the courtroom would have heard that. That was at the Court of Appeals level. But having uh, been a whistleblower, then qualified me to file a whistleblower case. So that's basically what the request for correction was, was establishing, you know, your contractors did this, this, and this. For example, Underwriters Lab made a mock-up of the floor, two full-scale mock-ups and two half-scale mock-ups. They cooked them... physical mock-ups of concrete yes. and steel. Yeah, of the floor. Yeah, yeah. And they uh, set them on fire, cooked them for twice as long, at twice the temperature, and none of them failed to support load. So the idea that they collapsed... They couldn't Hang reproduce case. that. They couldn't reproduce that. Yet they signed off a report saying the fire did it. That's fraud. There was, you go down the long list of things like that. So then I filed the, the KETAM case, and the lower court uh, dismissed it because one of the things he, he listed was he wasn't going to hear a case about who shot JFK or what landed on the moon. That's what he said. In yeah. This, on the decision. But this wasn't a case about that. No, it wasn't, was it? it was, that could be another case, of course. Right. And we appealed it to the higher court, to the Court of Appeals, and they saw us in court for eight minutes. Um, that written decision stated, they were very respectful, they stated in there, uh, they, they acknowledged that the law applied to this case, but for the ease of writing their dismissal, they, they were ignoring that law. So they ignored the law that made them consider your case. Right. And can you not appeal against that? We appealed to the Supreme Court, but they don't have to hear the case, just if they feel like it. They don't even need to say why they're going to just deny hearing the case. So, effectively, you can't appeal to the Supreme Court. I take right, it that they not didn't truly. Hear, I take yeah. it that they didn't hear your case. Right, right. So the Supreme Court refused to hear your case, but they didn't tell you why they refused to Right. Hear. So although you brought a case, it can never have a resolution. Right. Okay. But here's the interesting thing that you know, finally dawned on me after that written decision where the judges were acknowledging they were ignoring the law. Think about that. Think about, can you hear this case in a courtroom? But I, I see that all the time in America, I'm sorry to say. I mean, I see, you know, I see extrajudicial killings of American citizens by predator drones that the Americans seem to completely ignore. <laughs> but this so the case, rule of law, I mean, it seems to be... Uh, it's not just it's that. It's a pick it or choose it, you know, it's a, it's a choose to use it or choose to not use it option in America these days. May, that may be, be so, but what I saw in this was, think of the, the enormity of this case. Would you want to be the judge hearing that case? Would you well, worry about clearly, being justified on the way to work? Well, this is clearly why they didn't want to hear it. I can understand why yeah. they would say, we're not hearing it. I can understand that, it especially if they don't have to say. Also, it, it exposes classified technology. Somebody's classified technology, it doesn't matter whose. You're not going to hear that in a civil case unless it's behind closed doors. And if you put it behind closed doors, 
you're acknowledging that. The cat's out of the bag. The only way to keep the cat in the bag is to not hear the case. Okay. All right, I think we need to look at some of the other effects of okay. this technology then that, you, that you've identified. Let's go... Um, toasted cars? Let's go to toasted cars. Let's go to image 114, if we can, please. 114. Um, this is... Uh, I can't find it on my list here. Yeah, this is a map of the areas of, of New York uh, where the toasted cars were found. As, as you can see, they seem to be a hell of a long way from the, um, from the towers. And those lines around the towers are where the debris fields were. Is that correct? Yeah, within those, those um, zones around the towers where I saw solid material. Okay, we're solid material. Them. So these cars that had these extraordinary effects that seem to defy the laws of physics were in areas where they didn't have the buildings falling on them. Okay, let's, let's, let's look at 118. This is, this is a toasted car. Or 119? We'll go to that in a minute. Okay. Let's go them in the right order, eh? Okay, I was thinking 119 is the map that shows where the cars... I know, but I, okay. I, I just want to do them in the right order, otherwise okay. we, we can get confused here. Um, so this is a toasted car. This is on... Um, this is some distance. That's sitting over an FDR drive. FDR drive. Oh, this is on the East River. Right. We don't know if it was toasted there or if it was uh, carted there. You know, to be, to be precise, we didn't witness that. But we do have cars that were witnessed as going into spontaneous combustion. Okay, well, let's look at 119 then. This is a map of lower Manhattan the, the, with the, uh, the, the site of the World Trade Center is on the left. And the toasty cars, there's a big car park full of them way up on the, on the top left. And there were lots of them under a flyover. Yeah, an on the East pass, River. As you call it, on the East River. Way over on the East River, blocks away. Uh, the, there was a uh, fellow, uh, Alan Cook, who was standing down there. And suddenly the cars went into spontaneous combustion right before him. He was over by the South Street Seaport. And trying to figure out how to explain it, it must blow people's minds. He rationalized that it must have been a fireball that got loose from the World Trade Center, rolled down the street and hit the car. Because why else would the car go into spontaneous combustion? Yeah, it does seem, it does seem somewhat unlikely, doesn't it? So, uh, okay, let's go to the next one. This is 120. And this this that, is another map of... And that uh, long zone at the top in the middle, that's West Broadway. And about every car for about four blocks was toasted. The paper wasn't burned. The buildings weren't burned. The trees weren't burned. Trees there were, were cars burned. underneath green Bush, trees. Bushy green trees. Bushy, and they weren't singed or... Right. And they were like weirdly burned, weren't they, some of these cars? Some of them, the engines were missing. And... Exactly. Okay, let's go to 121. Let's look at some of, the, uh, of what happened. The toasted bus. The toasted bus. And this, it looks like some of it's melted. I mean, the metal has melted. What's interesting is you see in the distance, Building 7 is still standing. So you know about what time it is. Building 7 fell at about 5.20 in the right. afternoon or, of 9-11. Well, it's finally, but it's finally Sorry, demise. Sorry, fell. <laughs> Evaporated and... Or and went away. away. <laughs> okay. But notice the car on the very right, on the edge of the picture. Yeah. It's rusted. Yeah, it's rusty, isn't it? Yeah. Steel, does it, especially car steel, doesn't rust instantly. Well... Unless something happens to it. It's very unlikely, isn't it? Even if it got soaking wet in salt water in a few hours, it would not go... Well. It still has some areas of its paint showing, its undercoat, but it's, it's pretty amazing how quickly these vehicles rusted. Let's look at 122. This is lots more... Um, toasted cars. The photo in the upper right corner, notice the door handle's missing. That was just a pattern I noticed. And also you see the vehicles on the far side of the street with the trunk lid popped open. Car in the middle has the sliding door open. Car on the right, something's weird about its engine underneath the front end. But it seemed to be that the door latches and trunk latches, you call them boots. Boots, we do call yeah, them boots, yes. Popped. And they, um, car right below that in the bottom right corner, its engine is missing. The engine is missing, so how did that car get there? This is, you know, this is... And there were several cars, weren't there? Lots the of engines them. just gone. 
But of course, engines are made of iron. Right. Largely, some of them are made of aluminium. I know before you all text in, I know some are. But many are made of iron. Yeah, in particularly more in America, where they don't like aluminium engines <laughs> for some reason. In the bottom left corner, you see a, you know, missing engine. But the car in the, in the picture of the bottom left, but the car in the right side of it. Notice the abrupt change between the front end and the door. And that's where that arrow is pointing to that. Right. Abrupt change. So it looks like you know one half is. I know in your book you say one half is like wax on, wax off. Yeah. And the other half is just ter terminal wreck. But it gets you thinking about the rubber gasket they put around doors. Yeah. As though that's uh, an insulator. So this is the electrical part of your nuclear electrical uh, magnetic. I'm just noticing the, the, this, uh, you know, trend that you have this abrupt change on the doors. In that top left picture, can we just go back to that picture again? One, two, two. In that in that top left picture, what what is that? Uh, I think it used to be a, a mail truck. <laughs> I mean, a building didn't fall on it, did it? And if it did, it was just dust and paper. Parallelogram kind of thing. It, it's extraordinary, isn't it? It is extraordinary. And the, the, the police car that's parked right next to it, you see just the back end's toasted, not the door again. The front is fine. Yeah. So it appears. And let's, let's look at the, fi the final picture of toasty cars. We have got, there's plenty more in Judy's book, but let's... I'll go crazy here. But let's look at one, two, three. Now this one... Unburned paper. Unburned paper all over the place. There's green trees there. And the, the, the second car back on the right clearly doesn't have an engine. Another car parked in the street. How did it get there without an engine? Did someone just... On that day, did lots of people decide to go out and take a car out with, the, with no engine? There is a tremendous number of them, including in the parking lot. But there's another trend to that. Notice the traffic light's still there. Yes, it is. It's, it's potted in the ground. Same with the signpost and the buildings. So you're saying it's earthed? Yeah. Whereas the cars are on rubber tires. Yeah. Ah. And things that are not uh, grounded can build up a charge more. You know, this is what I like about your book, I've, I've got to say, Judy, because you're looking at evidence and you're just saying, how can this be explained by two planes flying into tall buildings? These cars are, in some cases, miles away from the, from the buildings that were hit by planes. What on earth happened? I'd like to, if we could go to 119, there's something else I'd like to back point to out there. Back to 119, okay, let's go back to 119. There is an can. EMT driving across the Manhattan Bridge on this the far it. right. The Manhattan Bridge is the bridge on the right. Three quarters of miles away, and she said you could feel the heat from the bridge. Okay, this is an eyewitness. Yes. Saying you can feel the heat from the bridge. Yeah, first responders. The, 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 the sorry, the heat from the World Trade Center. Yeah. There's unburned paper for the three quarters of a mile in between. She was feeling something, but it couldn't be conventional heat. Could it be like microwave radiation? Because that can heat you up. Yeah, it could be some, some kind of energy field that was perceived as heat. And because she's high up, she's raised up on that bridge, isn't she? And Although no, there are lots of tall buildings. Notice the toasted cars. On FDR Drive? Yeah, right in front of her along that same line of sight. Oh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Drive. Okay. I believe it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so... Lots of weird stuff happened on that mm -hmm. day that you have spent 10 years fire cannot, looking for at the, an explanation. Fire cannot cause a building to collapse, but a steel frame building, but also uh, if the building collapses from whatever, from bombs in the building, from fire, whatnot, how does that explain cars being toasted a half mile away? It's hard to, uh, it's hard to understand that. Let me see if I can find a couple of uh, good questions here. Uh, Denise says, could you conceivably take this to court in another country to get, to get some answers to your questions? Take it to court in another country? In another country. Um, if somebody has this gizmo, uh, you know, is it going to dust, who are they going to dustify? Yeah. Hey, I've, <laughs> I've got to tell you here, Judy, Mike from Manchester has said, sent me another text. He says, I take it back, Theo, the latest facts have just hit me like a drunken woodpecker. <laughs> I think she has a point. Well, you know, this is the aim of this, this show. This is wonderful. Just yeah. to present Dr. Judy Wood's facts 
And, you know, you can decide, you can take what you want from them, but I do recommend, I do sincerely recommend this book, Where Did the Towers Go? Because I, I got this book, I actually bought it, I didn't even get a free <laughs> copy. And, well, you should ask me. And it took, well, yeah, there you go. And I spent like two and a half, three days reading this with my mouth open, frankly, because it is just extraordinary. And whether you believe it's thermite or thermate or nanothermite or mini nukes or little gnomes with pickaxes that brought those towers down, you owe it to yourself, I think, you know, to read this book. So that's, you know, that's It's my, evidence. Yeah. It's just what's there. It's just evidence. And, you know, you can take it or leave it, I guess. But, you know. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk some more about, um, you know, one of the questions that we've got here, uh, one of them said something like, has she got a theory? I can't find it now. Um, oh, actually, no. Gary Makin in Liverpool said, could this be the result of, oh, it's gone funny again, uh, a satellite-based microwave weapon? Could it be? <laughs> Uh, it's not from a single um, source. It seems to be from an interference of different uh, field effects. Okay, different field effects. Well, yeah. One of which might be microwave radiation. Correct. Might and be. I don't know what, what exactly it, it would be, but you, it, if you want to reproduce these effects, they can be reproduced by creating a static field, and within that static field, interfere radio frequency signals and it acts like a key unlocking this effect okay so what it's doing it's 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 uh, on a quantum level if you like it's reacting with certain materials like for instance it clearly doesn't work on paper I don't mean well, some down, aspect I mean... some aspect of it doesn't um, whatever happened at the towers was very intense Let's say there's uh, spurious effects that just, you know, are less affected outside that region, well, we might would, affect other things, I mean, you know, less. Okay, we haven't got time to talk about some of the effects that were seen on the ground afterwards, the, the fuming ground, and the fact that the people clearing the site brought in thousands of tons right. of earth, laid it on the right. site, and then carted it away again. Or that um, buildings nearby that had suffered a little bit of damage were rusting in a peculiar way. One thing that's interesting is, if you think about it, if these buildings went to the ground, crashed yeah. the ground, to get that building down in whatever length of time, you have to get all of the contents that were in it squirting out, like at Mach 2. Yeah. Average speed, Mach 1.5. Twice 1. the speed 5. of sound. Is... Right. And the adjacent buildings would look like they'd been machine gunned. Well, some of them did have holes in the windows, didn't they? The windows, not the facade. And there were round holes in the windows. And sometimes it only the outer pane without damaging the inner pane. I've been thinking about that, the round holes thing. There is a photograph of the, the building across the road, which has got two different names, hasn't it? It's, it's the Verizon building and oh, Deutsche the, Bank. Oh, uh, the Deutsche Bank or Banker's Trust. Banker's Trust. I beg your pardon. Verizon is another building. Yeah, okay, Banker's Trust had lots of round holes in the windows. And what occurred to me, and uh, I'd like to give you this idea, that when you look at sunlight falling through a tree, even though the leaves themselves might be jagged, the little patches of light on the ground tend to be circular. So maybe, could it be that there's some kind of... So I did it. <laughs> ...similarity there. Um, the holes, the round holes in the glass. I've got a picture in my book where it's been replicated with these weird energy effects. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about John Hutchison. Uh, John Hutchison is a... How would you describe him? Uh, he's uh, a unique character. But he did not begin this technology. As I said, George Piggott got a patent on it 100 years ago yesterday. Okay. And for the, the same type of thing, and John Hutchison was trying to replicate the work of Nikola Tesla as well as uh, Thomas Townsend Brown and George Piggott and uh, various other people. And, but the, the wonderful thing about John Hutchison is he's alive now. You can go visit him and see a demonstration of this right before your he eyes. He is in Vancouver, I think. Uh, he's now moved to the United States in, oh, has he? Oh, in um, okay. Minnesota. Oh, I'm gonna say, okay. But uh, you, know, you can't go. Well, I don't know how to go back in time to visit, you know, people. I have, sp I have spoken to him on the phone, and he is an interesting character. 
I suppose what you would describe him as a sort of self-made scientist in a way. He, he, he buys a lot of kit, like ex-army and military <laughs> kit, like things that do stuff with microwaves and radar and radio. And Tesla and coils or Van de Graaff generators. He builds a lot of stuff and he takes them apart and, and fiddles around Let's with them. Let's see what this does. And he, and he has achieved a lot of very strange effects and he's, his work has been looked at by military, top-level military companies and government agencies in America, Canada, France and other nations. Um, but he is a bit of a maverick, isn't he? He is like, he's not your conventional scientist. Well, he's not really a scientist. He's, he enjoys playing with the equipment and seeing, like, this is fun. Let's see if we can make this thing fly across the room. Okay, we've got, we, we, we've got some images. Let's, let's look at image one, two, four. Now, this isn't Hutchison effect. This is, these are beams from the World Trade Center. Yes. And John. I don't know how you can explain that with conventional loading, because when things buckle, they get a sharp edge. Like, and they crack, don't they, on the edge, where that, right. there'd be like a split in the middle. Besides, this is a, more than a 180 degree bend. Yeah. This is just like the God's play thing, isn't it? Okay. It's like the material has been softened somehow, reshaped, and then re-solidified. Okay, let's look at one, two, five. The, the, this is more pictures of 9-11. Uh, These are 9-11 pictures again, aren't they? These. Yes. You notice that column on the right, how straight it is? Uh -huh. It doesn't look like it's buckled over, but it's curled around the vertical axis. You see that spandrel belt's kind of folded over. And that one on the left, I don't think you can come up with any kind of physical loading that would cause that. It looks more like a lasagna noodle. And this is you speaking as a structural... Right. Scientist, a structural... Yeah. Draw a free body engineer. diagram and show me the loading that would cause a, a column to do that. It, it, does, it does seem quite unlikely. Okay, let's look at 126 here. This is, um, well, uh, this is kind of uh, perhaps not quite uh, appropriate, but it's showing... A, 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 it's a time, it's a very short time distance between these two images. It's a, the piece on the left is higher up. And then when it gets lower, and it's just going over building three, it's got less material to it, some pieces missing. But notice how straight that panel is. It's not kinked, it's not bent, it's not buckled, it's straight. It's just coming off the building, so it's not being, it's not being buckled. Okay, and the final shot we've got is, oh! <laughs> Welcome back to One Step Beyond with me, Theo Charles, and my special guest, Dr. Judy Wood. Uh, just before the break there, we were talking about John Hutchison and the Hutchison effect, and we showed some examples of weird bending and materials disappearing in the, in the, in the pressure and, and stresses on materials in the, the Twin Towers. I think we need, to, um, we need to look at an image of that John Hutchison has created. If we look at image number 127, this is... On the left, this is the picture we saw before of, yes. of steel from one of the Twin Towers. And on the right, this is a piece of solid... Molybdenum. Molybdenum, which is particularly hard, isn't it's, it? It's like, it kind of like steel. Some steel has a lot of that in it. And this has been bent by... The Hutchison effect. By the Hutchison effect, which there are clearly some similarities. Uh, and we're going to show a film as well, aren't we? We've got, we've got a, can, we, uh, can we run that film? This is a... Do you want to describe what this is? This is a solid block of iron, two inches by two inches by seven inches. Okay. Flex the fumes to mop it. That was pretty extraordinary, wasn't it? And, and it looked like, also, that, that block of uh, steel, or iron, is that iron? Yeah, iron, it's just iron. was on a paper towel, right. or, a, or a cloth towel, but it, there's obviously no heat involved. Uh, it actually ends up being a little bit cooler to the touch than ambient temperature. So, okay, so even less heat. Less, yeah. Okay. But you notice the fumes coming off of it. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, and there was a lot of fuming 
out in the World Trade Center site, wasn't there? Especially door handles and things like that. There's a, a video we have uh, door handles fuming. The window's busted open. Why isn't aren't the fumes coming out there? Why are they coming off the door handle? And the door handles were one of the first things the to oh, go that's away. One of, one of the films that, that yeah, we, yeah, that I've seen that uh, uh, you sent me. Yeah, but okay. So a lot of weird stuff. Yeah. A lot of weird effects. Some of which looks like some of the effects that John Hutchison right. is getting. Uh, the question is, you know, if this is zero point energy or free energy or some kind of energy. Is there an energy source on that day? And I know I'm leading the question here because I know um, you say that there was. No, not exactly. Okay. <laughs> what John Hutchison can do is reproduce all of the same effects. And so let's look how he does it. He creates a static field, and within the static field interferes various radio frequency signals. Hmm. I was looking at where the dust went up. The dust seems to, you know, fumes go up. And when I went to it from the World Trade Center and I went to study that more and more and I thought I'd get some weather satellite images to mm -hmm. get a better look. And then what was this I saw? There was a hurricane. <laughs> right outside this, of Manhattan. This is the really weird thing, isn't it? There was a big hurricane on the morning of 9-11 just off the coast of New York State. In a category Amman. three. Category 3 hurricane called Erin. And bizarrely, it seems, no one on the news mentioned it. Now, I, I told they, you they earlier, did. I was in New yeah. York during Hurricane, Hurricane Gloria. And believe me, it was everywhere, all over, every news channel. And it was no worse or, or, than this one, than Hurricane Erin. It was heading straight for Manhattan. Hurricane Irene, but this past fall. They evacuated Manhattan, and the thing was barely a Category 1, and it was busting up over land. So let's look at some images of that. Let's look at image 128. Here we go. This is 128. Uh, this is a satellite picture of Hurricane Erin on the morning of 9-11, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there you can see New York City with a circle around it. Massive hurricane. You would think this would be all over the news, wouldn't you? Like, you know, maybe not mandatory evacuation, but voluntary, because if that doesn't turn around... That's heading that way. Well, let's... let's then how's the, the sea level? Let's look at the direction it was heading. Let's look at 129. Here we go. This is the direction of Hurricane Erin. It's going from the bottom to the top. So on the morning of 9-11, it was at the closest point. Is that correct? Mm hmm To Manhattan. Not very far at all. You saw how big it was in that other image. And when it pulled up uh, close to Manhattan, it got larger, like a figure skater puts their arms out to slow down. Uh -huh. And then that afternoon, it kind of packed up and headed out of town. Okay, and now let's look, at, let's look at image 130. This is the actual news report images that we use on that day. And you have superimposed the hurricane where it should have been on those news reports. Is that correct? Correct. This is the television news on different channels. I can't read it. Um, on the, am, the left the, image, I added the little red arrows to point out the thunderstorms all around the perimeter of the country. Now, there was a high pressure system, which is a... Good weather. Well, it's also a, a counter cyclone, anti-cyclonic. Okay. It goes the opposite direction of a hurricane. And it was throughout the, the country moving eastward while the hurricane was moving westward. And they met over Manhattan at 10 a.m. that morning. You can tell from the uh, pressure measured at JFK Airport, the pressure is starting to go up from the high pressure system moving in. Mm -hmm. And then it starts going down because the hurricane reached there. Mm -hmm. Or the edge of the hurricane. Edge of the hurricane. These images are from the morning news from 10 to 15 minutes before the North Tower got its hole. They, it, it wasn't that they didn't mention Hurricane Aaron, but was so downplayed and underplayed that you kind of wonder why. And but, they, but, they didn't, but they actually, they removed it from the satellite images. But, uh, no, th those were like cartoon images of the, of the weather. And actually, CBS had a little lettering over New York said, as, as nice as can be for the weather. <laughs> it was interesting. But well, the hurricane correct, it, was, it was a very nice day, night, right. wasn't it? Blue sky, sunny, right. a beautiful autumn morning. But the hurricane was right outside of town. And folks say, well, it wasn't over Manhattan. Ah, but it was close enough. 
People talk about feeling the weather change. You know, you can feel the, a storm front coming. You can sense it coming because you're feeling the field effects ahead of the storm. Turns out the three major airports surrounding Manhattan, that's JFK Airport, LaGuardia, and Newark mm -hmm. airports, all reported thunder on 9-11. So it was close enough. That says there were field effects there. Can we, a static can, field. Can we go back to 129, please? Image 129. OK, because this, this shows something pretty weird, because it's going in a straight line for Manhattan for what seems like several days from the 7th. For, for four days, it was in a straight line. Four days, it was in a straight line. And then suddenly, it takes a sharp right turn and scoots off out into the Atlantic. It was pretty stationary for about uh, 12 hours before and 12 hours after the events on 9-11. So for the 24 hours surrounding the events, the wind uh, speed stayed the same, the air pressure stayed the same in the hurricane, and the location was approximately the same. Well, you must be aware there are those who believe that the American government and other governments, including Russia, have the power to change the weather using something called HARP. Do you, do you subscribe to that point of view? I don't go with any, like, you know, theories at all. And as for HARP, we don't know what HARP does. We know what we're we know told. It exists, though, don't we're, we? we're told about it. But we personally do not know. Remember, know what you know, what you know you know, and know what you don't know you okay, know. Okay, well, just fill in for those who don't know. HARP stands for High Altitude Active Auroral Research Project. And it's to do with uh, massive amounts of radiation beamed into the they, ionosphere, I think. Yeah, they, they, that's what they tell us, that it uh, makes a little kind of like bubble in the ionosphere to, to so it heats it up to, to send things back down. And there are, there are several sites around the world, including one in Norway and two in Alaska and one in Russia and others, I believe. But I'm just looking at, again, the evidence. I don't know that the hurricane was used that day. But I know it could have been. It, I know that hurricanes create a static field, and we get the same kind of weird effects, you know, car sitting on a telephone pole, that type of thing. You know, evidence of levitation. Yeah, there's some fantastic pictures in your book, actually. Car of, sitting on a fence. A car sitting on a fence. And there's a another one of a, of a, of a uh, Two plank before. through, uh, yeah, through a, uh, an upright um, palm telegraph tree. pole. Or a palm tree. Uh, palm yeah, tree. there was a uh, two before it went through a palm tree. That was Hurricane Andrew. Yeah. That did that. So there's this weird effect on materials, like it softens them up and, you know, things, it, straw through trees. Yeah, straw through trees. That's, it's that a, defies belief, doesn't it? Yeah, vortex it? kind of uh, energy system. Okay. It's pretty weird. Okay. So, you know, this is the last segment of the show. Um, I, I do, let me clarify something. I do not say, like, the, the extension cord for the gizmo was plugged into the hurricane. No, the, you don't say No, that. no. But it's possible. And not really. Um, I'm saying that it creates a static field. It's a massive amount of power in a hurricane. But it's a static field, and that's part of the key. It's not the amount of power. Like what John Hutchison does, you just plug it into a regular outlet. They're 110, you know, in, in North America. 110 volts, yeah. And it doesn't take much power. It's the type of interference that counts. Uh, if you create a static field, and within that interfere radio frequency signals, Voila, you get this weird effect. And I think it's important that we start looking at what we're doing with radio frequency signals and natural weather systems. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, that's, that's fair enough. Let's, let's look then at, you know, what we've, what we've done tonight is we've explored some evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you claim, uh, this, none of this evidence in this book has been refuted. Correct. But now that people have taken this on board, and even Mike in Manchester now says, oh, you know, you've, you've got something, uh, those who now think maybe there is something to this, what can they do with it? What, you know, what, what can empower them from this point on? You know, because a lot of people have, have dismissed the official version and have thought that the solution, which seems fairly... Um, mundane was, you know, okay, they used some kind of explosives, it was thermite, it was maybe mini nukes or whatever it was, you know, what can they do with the knowledge that it was truly weird? You know, the limited hangout is the limited hangout. 
But what really happened that day may have been something that's, that's mind-blowingly weird. What, could, what can people do with it? I don't want people to go, oh, God, it's all terrible, yeah. you know? Oh, not, the opposite is, is true. Uh, the way I wrote this book is to empower the reader to think for themselves. Because if we expect someone else to give us our opinion, we're leaving our thinking to someone else's keeping. And we're nothing but programmable robots then. But Which it's to some extent we are, aren't we? Right. But to take back our ability to think, you know, use it or lose it. And I like to empower the reader to think. The evidence is right before you. I lead you through looking at all of this. And at the end, you can see, when you look at this cover, that's not a collapse. Something extraordinary happened that day. And it was yeah, more of it's going up than going down, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Let's, let me show you to the camera. I think okay. it'll probably be on that camera there. Yeah. I mean, this is an extraordinary image, isn't it? There you go. I'll get my hands out of the way. But, but this was done in front of the entire world. That was, that was the great conjuring trick, wasn't it? It was done in front of the entire world. There's nobody who didn't watch it. Well, right. There's very few people who weren't it. aware of that. Yeah. In other words, this was a demonstration in front of the entire planet of this technology. But people were kind of uh, derailed into understanding what they see. Well, within minutes, the, the, mm -hmm. the names were on television. You know, Osama bin Laden was... Grab your pitchfork, go get the bad guy. Yeah, you know, let's, uh, you know, the invasion of Afghanistan was already organized before it happened. You know, it's like everything's in place. But right now, when people develop free energy technology in the secrecy of their basement, they're suicided, something happens to them. If everybody in the world knows this technology exists, we're all free to develop it in broad daylight. You know, I, but I've read so many things about free energy technology, and I've seen lots of little clips of people with little magnet things spinning around. But it never comes on the market, does it? It's never, right. you know, there's, there's, come, there's a company in Ireland called uh, Steorn, I think they're called, S-T-E-O-R-N or something like that, who have developed some technology which they've now, you know, are now sort of hiring it out to people to develop. But, but mostly it never happens. Why, why is that? Why? Same reason why uh, Wardenclyffe Tower. Well, Tesla it's a Tesla's tower that was, You're right. that was you built and then it. demolished immediately. This you is can't the meter free it. energy tower. You can't meter it. They wouldn't give it away. It's a, it's the Edison company wouldn't give away electricity. I think we need to move to a, a culture that doesn't live on exploiting others, but just lives to live and lives to share. I think that really is where we've come to. If everyone knows about this technology, it's safer. That means everyone grows up realizing we need to be careful of how this is used. We need to use it for good, not bad. But how many times have we heard that, Judy? I mean, I'm sorry, but, you know, the nuclear weapons mm -hmm. that were developed in the Second World War, when have they been used for good? <laughs> they haven't, have they? But this could destroy the planet like that. Well, it could destroy it. No, but you, you, come on, you're talking about evidence here. You're, you're right. saying that you follow evidence. You don't know that. All you know is that it can destroy several, but seven buildings in Lower Manhattan. But the amount of energy, if directed a different way. Do you realize that a, a, a Category 12 earthquake would split the earth in half? What's the highest we've had? Nine something, I think. Would split the Earth in half. Right, but you also know that amount of energy. That's the same amount of energy the Earth gets from the sun every day. And that energy supports life instead of destroying it. Yeah. So we need to choose how we want to use energy. Just out of interest, if the Earth was split in half, and I'm asking you as a scientist, wouldn't it just pop back together again? <laughs> Gravity would just go, wouldn't it? Might don't know. Bit, don't know. You know. Don't know. Haven't been there, done that. <laughs> so okay. So you know, we, the, yes, there are enormous forces at play. Nature has mm -hmm. forces that make what we can or what we have historically made insignificant. I mean, you know, a massive great meteorite from outer space could wipe us all out right now. Couldn't it? It would destroy this planet utterly. 
What might this technology be able to be used for to destroy the meteorite, the meteor coming in before it gets here? So what you're saying is, OK, I'm getting where you're coming from now. What you're saying is then that if, if we were to say, if the people who have this technology were to say, and I don't think it's very likely, frankly, but let's hope maybe some of them are the good guys would say, actually, let's give this to mankind like Tesla did. And let's, let's develop these weapons that would protect us from random meteorites. Or not even that. If the common person understands that this technology exists, that allows it to be uh, freely developed in broad daylight by regular scientists around, and it ends up falling into better hands than who has it now. We've seen whoever has it now, we know how they like to use it. Well, that's, this, you know, this is one of the problems that, that I do have with it. It does only seem to have been used on that mm. one day, and that was 10 years ago. You know, if I had a toy like that in my toy box, I'd be bringing it out and polishing it and going, oh, I'll just, you know, just fire it at that over there, you know. There are other, other uh, suspicious events that have occurred that have a lot of the same symptoms. Okay, let's talk about those. Oklahoma City has cylindrical out cutouts. Out the Alfred P. Morrow building. Yes. Cylindrical cutouts without enough material left, toasted cars. M McVeigh said, was, one man was found guilty of setting off a truck bomb, wasn't he? They caused cylindrical cutouts in, in the building. There were cylindrical cutouts, and there were lots of deaths as well, of course, including a, a, a nursery for children, babies in a nursery yeah. were slaughtered. And there this were... This is Oklahoma City in, right. in what year was this, 80? 95, I 95, think. 95, was it? The, uh, also the Minnesota Bridge. Imagine all 12 supports give way at the exact same moment to the point the bridge went down horizontally, landed at the bottom, and the people got out of their, their vehicles. Very few people died compared to what you would think if a bridge collapsed. Uh, also, when the bridge was destroyed, it only had half the load it normally has because they had half the bridge closed for working on it. It's kind of interesting, but the fact that it went down horizontally and then there was spontaneous combustion of vehicles around for who knows what reason. Is there a big research establishment near the Minnesota Bridge? I've, I've heard there is, but to me that isn't so much the issue. I was there right afterwards. Oh, in Minnesota? Yeah, at the, at the bridge, and it was very strange. They closed the adjacent bridge so you couldn't drive across it and take pictures of the site. This was prior to 9-11, was it? Uh, no, this is 2007. 2007, okay. I beg your pardon. August 1. I mean, I'm slightly familiar with it, but... But all the supports of the bridge giving way at the exact same moment, so the roadway dropped down horizontally. This is over a river, wasn't it? Right, and, and the vehicles didn't roll off the bridge. But surely they were in the river now, were they? The, the right, but the people climbed out of their, their cars, and they came in boats and loaded up the people, and... There were some people and you were there on the day? Uh, two days later. It hadn't rained in between times. There was a weird smell there. Uh, weird uh, guards. You couldn't even get within, you know, half a mile of the place. Well, you, yeah, but you could understand why they would try and protect it from souvenir hunters or... Yeah, you couldn't even take pictures. Couldn't get close enough to take a picture or even the adjacent bridge taking a picture of it. It was pretty strange. Are there any other examples? Um, I haven't studied them that carefully, but these are just, uh, you know, suspicious events that I've not carefully looked through. There's much more evidence in New York City for what happened, so that's why I've studied that particular site. Of course, the, the Pentagon, you know, I wonder uh, how paper doesn't burn, but the building goes away. You know that roof that supposedly uh, collapsed yeah. down? Where, where it ended up? It was very close to the ground. There's supposed to be like, what, three or four stories of building in between? Yeah. Where'd it go? Well, there were also three of the, of the, of the circular buildings, you know, the, the penta pentagonal buildings. Right. There were like five, the built, Pentagon is built out of five, For rings. five rings, and, and the three outer rings were pierced by something. They had cylindrical cutouts in the roof as well. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Well, but, actually, well, let's talk about a little bit quickly about the fact that aeroplanes are made out of what you call aluminum, and we call... Aluminium. Alu <laughs> aluminium, thank you. And how did an aluminium plane punch through 
the outer steel of the World Trade Center towers, but also how did it pump through the, 18, the, the six 18-inch thick reinforced concrete walls of the three rings that it went through of the Pentagon? How did an I, aluminium plane... I, I don't know, I can't explain like that. this thin, it's got to be light, hasn't it, to fly? I, I can't explain that. No, well... <laughs> It is very unlikely. What really uh, concerned me is the the right wingtip, yeah. the little slot. You know, wing which plane is, um, is this the South Tower or the North? Right, tower? the South Tower. The second one to be here, the one yeah. that's on lots of film. Yeah, or both of them had that same kind of um, outline of a of a wing. Like a road runner. Right, thing. like a road runner cutout. Yeah. Think about it. They can't even carry fuel out the end of the wing, because it's not strong enough. And also, wings say you know, no step here. You know, because oh, it's delicate. You can't step on it, yeah, because right. it's so weak. And you see that, I've seen recently a picture of a plane in an airport where the, out, the edge of the wing hit the airport building. There was no hole in the airport building, but the wing was wrecked. Right. You know, it was just taxiing. It wasn't going at, you know, several hundred miles an hour. Like, right. But that doesn't, make any, that doesn't affect Newton's laws of motion, does yeah, it? Yeah, equal and opposite forces. Yeah. So it would have bounced off, wouldn't it? Or you would have thought that... Now, I don't know about bouncing off, but, uh, you know, a, a thin aluminum wing isn't going to slice through a steel column. Yeah. That, that's a problem I had with that. Yeah. So, uh, okay. I'm not saying what happened, but I'm saying uh, that story doesn't make sense. Okay. Well, I think we're going to end it there, Judy. Okay. Okay. That's all we've got time for. Thank you to everyone for watching and to those who texted, and thanks to my guest, Dr. Judy Wood. If you want to learn more about her work and what you can do, please visit... Um, oh, my order queue is no longer working. <laughs> uh, WhereDidTheTowersGo.com and DrJudyWood.com. I look forward to inviting you to take one step beyond again. In the meantime, may the global seat be you.